All right. Thanks, Jake. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Um, before I start, I want to thank you all the organizers for having me today. Uh, and uh, as Jake was saying, uh, today's seminar is going to be about the role of simulation and robotics throughout the development cycle and the implication of deploying this kind of workflows in real world applications. I've structured the discussion in five sections. Uh, I'll first try to modulate and uh, motivate the discussion to put things in perspective so you can understand where I'm coming from, why I'm here today, and where simulation fits in all this. Uh, we'll discuss the kind of workflows that simulation enables. I'll try to give you some concrete examples of, from our experience in industry, and then we'll dive, if time allows, into the nitty gritty of present day multi body simulation uh, technology. Um, uh, I'll try to. I, I, this is. I, I haven't had time to rehearse this, so we'll see if I can, if I manage to fit it in in time. Um, so uh, before uh, talking uh, about how, uh, I think it's worth reflecting on why would you even consider doing robotics without robots. And I'll start with some hard numbers. Uh, Seventy-nine percent of global robot installations are in five countries. Uh, this as of uh, 2023, according to the IFR, and you can probably guess which countries are this: uh, the United States, China, South Korea, Japan, and Germany. Uh, second number: seventy-one percent of robotic startups are in ten countries. Uh, the same countries as before, plus a few European ones: the UK, Switzerland, France. Uh, ten countries out of almost two hundred. Um, Last one. Uh, this is a, a little dated, uh, but it's a ge the geographical distribution of AI or robotics related patents throughout a good portion of the 2010s, last decade. Uh, as I was saying, the data is a bit dated, but I don't think uh, anything has changed since, as this is consistent with the previous two uh, statistics. In this world, uh, Acumen, the company I work for, thrives. So the, uh, the company uh, has been providing niche expertise to engineering teams at robotic startups, at corporations, at research institutes uh, for a bit over a decade, uh, while being, on average, 10,000 miles away from our customers and any form of hardware. Uh, the company was founded in Argentina and first expanded throughout Latin America. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago, 2022, if my memory doesn't fail me, uh, that we opened a branch in Europe. Uh, and the company is finan fully financially healthy and close to 100 employees. Uh, at least at, uh, by the end of 2024, that's the plan. So how is that this work at all? Uh, well, there are a number of factors at play. Uh, I won't lie, a good, having a good network and competitive fees, fees help a lot, but there's more to it. In the past 20 years or so, uh, the open source ecosystem for robotics flourished. And ROS is but one example. There are others, MRPT, YARP, uh, MOOS, uh, an ecosystem that supports academia and industry to uh, research and apply AI, AI and robotic solutions um, to problems of ever increasing complexity. Solutions that are, for the most part, not entirely, for, but for the most part, computational in nature. And the software industry of all industries uh, is has been, and it still is to this day, quite culturally permeable uh, to remote work, even before work from home uh, was uh, became a thing with the pandemic. Um, our case is special though. Uh, we are not managing cloud infrastructure. We are not uh, building microservices architectures. I mean, strictly speaking, we do that too, uh, but that's not the bulk of what we do. Uh, our code has to run, sorry, on a robot. Uh, oh, here it is, uh, on real hardware. Uh, and so, we do what every other engineering branch has been doing since computer were, computers, personal computers uh, were made all. We simulate. Uh, what perhaps isn't uh, as common outside robotics is the demo democratization that simulation technology, and in particular, MBS, multi-body simulation technology, has gone through since the early 2000s. Uh, that is how we get uh, to do robotics without robots. And I want to double click uh, on simulation. Uh, I presume you all know what I'm talking about, but just in case, uh, for completeness, the basic idea is that we take what we know about the physics of multiple potential articulated or more generally constrained bodies, which are typically rigid, but not necessarily. Uh, These body, bodies that may collide with each other and slip past each other with some friction, we express that in some suitable coordinate system and we further integrate the differential equations in time. If our models are good approximations of reality, so will their state trajectories be. Depending on how far you take that idea, you'll get more or less adequate performances for the specific purposes you have. 
um, well before it was proposed uh, to give the seminar with, that we started discussing with an argument uh, about the idea of giving the seminar, I was told that uh, some people thought it was, uh, I don't know if the word is fascinating, but it was somewhat uh, uh, interesting to know that uh, uh, how a company like Acumen managed to do business, uh, to be in the business. We are uh, basically working off this technology. And I was uh, frankly a little bit amused that there's nothing novel uh, in what we do. Uh, Multi-value simulations have been around for over 50 years, uh, perhaps more. Uh, MC Adams dates back to, the to 1972 and it's still kicking. JPL developed arts to simulate unmanned space missions back in the 90s. But something changed in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, at the peak of the internet hype cycle, a number of physics and rendering engines came into existence, or it, it became they, they became widely available. Perhaps uh, the, the, internet, the internet had something to do with that. Uh, mostly driven by the gaming and the film industry, the entertainment industry, uh, which explains why uh, many of these technologies, many of these projects, uh, emphasize speed and stability over accuracy. There is no reason to spend uh, precious hardware cycles uh, on anything past physical plausibility when you're just building a game. Still, without limitation, these projects, projects like ODE, projects like uh, Bullet, uh, Box2D, uh, WebOts, uh, and others, uh, would lay the grounds for simulation in robotics for the next decade or so. Gazebo, uh, the, the classic version of Gazebo, not the modern one, and WebOts use Audi uh, under the hood. Uh, PyBullet is Bullet. Uh, and while nowadays we have simulation technology that's specifically tailored for robotics like Mojoko or Drake, uh, the bottom line is that using simulation in robotics has become much, much cheaper and way easier than it used to be uh, like a couple decades ago. So why, do you sh why should you care about this? Uh, even if you're not starting a company in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, you may have, I don't know, <laughs> there is value in simulation-driven workflows if you're doing robotics. A good enough simulation can perfectly function as a prototype or a twin once you're in, uh, you're in production, if you happen to be in production. It can add design optimization. It can be a source of vast amounts of uh, data for training. Uh, it can be used for manual automated testing. And uh, I'll stop right here with generalities, and I'll try to go over some concrete examples uh, of this. Exhibit A. Uh, this is a simulation for a research AUV, an underwater drone that we collaborated on with OSRF and a battery, which is an oceanographic institute uh, in California, in San Diego, or close to San Diego. Uh, the real AUV would spend days collecting data in the Pacific Ocean, not that far off from California uh, shores, uh, iterating on mission and trajectory control software for this kind of vessel, uh, usually means cross-country deployment to artificial lakes first, and then deployment at sea, first tether to a tripulated vessel, and then eventually uh, leave it free to, to submerge. Uh, as, you can, as you may imagine, this is super slow. It's crazy expensive, like really expensive. Uh, and necessarily so. You, you can't really afford a software crash of 100 miles of coast. Um, so having a simulation running much faster than real time enable them to quickly and safely validate call changes, reducing the number of iterations out in the field. It is also worth noting and relevant uh, to note that, that the simulation itself was far from perfect. It was actually built on top of Gazebo, which is a rigid body simulator with no built-in support whatsoever for fluid dynamics. We were only approximating hydrodynamics using a class of uh, relatively popular class of linearized models, but that was good enough. And this notion of good enough uh, or fit to requirement uh, is recurring. Uh, this is a simulation that we built on top of uh, Road Networks SDK. We we'll collaborated on. We helped build uh, uh, an SDK that uh, came out of a collaboration between OSRF and TRI uh, Research Institute that you might you might aware of, you might be aware of. Uh, the models here were purely kinematic, and that was enough for functional testing of autonomous driving decision making algorithms. Um, Exhibit C, uh, or the third one. Uh, this is a completely unrelated uh, thing. This is a simulation we put together for a customer in the material handling domain. Uh, they were looking forward to automating most of most of their testing, uh, most of the testing for the perception system. And we built this one on Isaac Sim instead, uh, NVIDIA simulator, uh, as photo photorealism was a requirement and domain randomization support in that simulator was handy. Uh, uh, 
the relevant thing is that what would take hours in the real world uh, would take minutes in simulation, uh, which means that you can then gatekeep every single contribution. And that's important not only for direct code changes uh, to a robot stack. For example, when you have a problem, when, yeah, when you're building a product uh, and you're maintaining it and supporting it over time, uh, it will continue to evolve. And during that uh, time, it will see, it will very likely see many dependency changes. Uh, the operating system uh, may change, the overall distribution may change. Uh, we actually had uh, a customer uh, in the food industry, I, I cannot disclose, uh, that uh, would de risk maintenance upgrades on simulation because every deployment they had in production was completely unique. And they did not have hardware replicas of their, their system in house. Uh, a simulation, uh, a CI/CD uh, workflow that's simulation driven streamlines that that kind of, of use cases. And speaking about uh, CI/CD, um, this is uh, a CI workflow that we put together for an open source educational robot that it can maintain. Uh, it is but a demonstration of uh, a form of automation that we have built over and over again for different customers, uh, and thus it's behind. Uh, uh, IP, um, a company IP. Uh, it uses GitHub Actions as the main uh, orchestrator, uh, but it delegates um, most of the work to AWS Raw Maker uh, so that you get better failure traceability. Uh, all the tests rely on a form of, or a simulation built on top of uh, GraphSQL Classic. And I, I cannot overstate how useful this kind of automated regression testing is. Uh, not only because it enables us to do a lot of all of what we do, uh, but, but because it, uh, it would enable you to scale and, and distribute engineering efforts. Uh, quickly iterating on hardware is, is and will always be relevant, especially during project inception. Uh, but manual QA quickly becomes unmanageable once you get past the first batch of robots uh, or first batch of models, and almost impossible when you want to ensure some degree of robustness through scale, essentially. Um, whatever the use case may be, and there are many, um, the first assessment, or one thing we've learned over time is that the first assessment that has to be done is one of purpose. Not every simulation, I mean, this might be obvious, uh, but uh, oftentimes you find uh, people getting blinded by uh, shine, the, the new shiny thing. Uh, not every simulation needs to be photorealistic. Not every aspect of, of the system needs to be modeled. Uh, a suitable trade-off between accuracy, complexity, flexibility, speed, and cost has to be found. Uh, and these are naturally couple. And this particular example might help, might help put, put things in perspective. Uh, this is a literally a 2D simulation we use to demonstrate Beluga, which is a, a, a another project, another open source project uh, that Ecumen uh, develops. Uh, it was built on top of Flatland, uh, which is a simulator that in turn uses Box 2D, well-known engine used for games, 2D uh, games, uh, like many other 2D simulators. Why 2D? Because running 2D LiDAR-based localization needs no 3D dynamics modeling, and a 2D simulation was way simpler and faster to develop. And this kind of pragmatism is often appro appropriate for functional testing uh, in general. Uh, I had a similar case uh, for uh, an agriculture um, mobile, well, a mobile robot uh, for uh, the poultry industry, uh, where uh, modeling the terrain was also way beyond the time budget we had to develop. Uh, so we had to resort to 2D simulators to do functional testing for a part of the system. Uh, and that was, uh, that, that spared me a few trips. Um, uh, 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 there we go. Uh, so, oh yeah, of course. So in summary, there is value in knowing what to use and when. So let's talk a little bit about, about technology. We're 20 minutes in, so I think I have time. Um, so a lot can be said about multi-body simulation and a lot that's in an entire library can be written. So I'll limit, uh, for this discussion, we'll limit ourselves to uh, a relatively shallow discussion over these four axes uh, that you see. The capabilities the system may have, the performance, 
particular computational are uh, well both computational and the performance itself itself in terms of accuracy and error you may expect from the simulator the user experience uh that you may uh that you may have uh, as you work with it and the overall support that the tools have uh and to ground that discussion we'll focus on a limited set of technologies uh i've purposely chosen uh modern generic slash general wildly up to fully featured uh, simulators why this in particular because flexible and general is at least in our experience almost always the best in the long run uh things change uh what you need today may change tomorrow may change in six months may change in a year um so you don't want to buy yourself a, a problem uh six months uh down the road um so let's start with physics modeling. Uh, all the simulators uh, the, uh, that uh, you saw before, uh, Drake, PyBullet, Mujoko, Gazebo, Webots, Isaac Sim, all 3D, uh, all of them allow for rigid bodies uh, with, primitive, um, with primitive and mesh geometries. By primitive, I mean, uh, you, you can think of spheres, uh, cubes, prisms, uh, cylinders. Uh, some of them, like Muchoko and Drake, uh, also support deformable bodies, uh, typically by embedding uh, finite element models uh, or approximating position dynamics for mesh vertices. There's some research that has come out in the last five years or so. Uh, all simulators are also, all of these simulators are also quite homogeneous when it comes to joint modeling. Uh, you typically get one degree of freedom and three degree of freedom joints with spring damper dynamics. Uh, it is on contact and friction modeling that the uh, simulator starts to show greater variation. Uh, the Coulomb model for friction is adopted by most, uh, and that usually uh, amounts to some polytope approximation to the conical string. Uh, the, the thing that you might see as uh, mentioned as, uh, as the friction pyramid. Uh, but Drake, the odd one off, uh, uses a continuous state function uh, that a uh, continuous uh, state nonlinear function uh, that uh, models the string effect. And I'll point on that because uh, this has some implications for how dynamics are solved uh, further down the line. Uh, rolling and isotropic uh, friction uh, support also varies, though anisotropic friction is less uh, less of a, a, a special feature nowadays. Uh, contact is usually point contact with or without contact coherence. On some older versions of Gazebo, uh, you may have seen uh, glitching uh, contacts, um, which may or may not allow for penetration. It might be hard contact or it might be soft con uh, contact. Drake's, again, uh, supports an alternative model. Uh, they published uh, two or three papers around this. Uh, this uh, thing that they dubbed the hyd hydroelastic contact model, uh, that basically, uh, you may uh, go into the uh, referred paper later on if you're interested, uh, derives for from a pressure distribution over the collision batch. Uh, and that makes for better contact stability. And that's why, uh, or at least I'm, that, that I'm aware, uh, that, that, that's why they use it as much for their uh, grasping and manipulation projects. Um, simulators, uh, I, I said at the beginning of the presentation that uh, many of the uh, present day technology originated in, uh, or was initially applied uh, for the gaming industry, uh, the film industry. Simulators that have a strong gaming heritage may support maximal coordinate formulations. That is, they track full body states. But generalized coordinates are otherwise ubiquitous, uh, and so are Featherstone-like algorithms uh, in one of its many forms. The original one using spatial algebra, others using a spatial uh, operator like SimBody, uh, and, and others. Um, perhaps one of the biggest differences uh, one can uh, found, sorry, one can find in the in the solvers that are used to forward integrate dynamics with friction. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm contact this well, the, the solvers itself, uh, fully uh, rigid bodies, uh, and the classical Coulomb uh, friction model lead to a discontinuity in the in the model uh, that is usually cast as a, an LCP, a linear complementarity problem which happens to be mp hard and uh, often, but not necessarily has to be solved iteratively for performance. That's where you will, uh, that, that, that's where all the uh, projected uh, gauss dells sequential impulse uh, solvers, dancing come from. Um, 
this kind of uh, limitation or, or inconveniences with uh, the solvers is what led to complementarity free alternatives. Uh, some based on convex relaxation uh, of the contact problem and some based on nonlinear approx non friction approximation. You remember well, what I said about how Drake model stuff uh, that allows, uh, that basically uh, go away with this discontinuity. Um, which happens to be very convenient uh, because complementarity free dynamics are differential, the other ones are not. Uh, and differentiality is what makes this uh, uh, solvers appealing for the optimal control and machine learning communities. Um, so moving past physics, going into scene rendering, uh, you, you can also write uh, entire libraries about rendering uh, standard 3D graphics techniques apply, uh, but only a few simulators provide uh, what we call photorealistic rendering capabilities. WebOS, O3D, Unity, Isaac Sim offer uh, physics-based rendering support in order to increase in sophistication, and that comes at a cost. We'll talk about that later. Uh, at this level of, uh, of detail, uh, 3D, uh, 3D graphics craftsmanship, uh, 3D artistry becomes uh, an asset. It's not uncommon to, uh, uh, for the workflows to have a fair share of Blender uh, or Maya uh, uh, as, as you build your simulations. Um, how and if physics and rendering engines are synchronized is also quite relevant, as this is where usually determinism <laughs> goes to die. I, I mean, well, one would have, one would from any simulator, one would expect, or at least desire, uh, a degree of reproducibility. And most engines out there, within a given, uh, given some constraints, uh, provide such guarantees. But once you add uh, rendering, threading, and the rest of the stack that will make use of the simulator, uh, those guarantees usually uh, get much, much harder to, to enforce, which doesn't necessarily mean that the simulation itself will be useless. Uh, it, it can sometimes be, uh, how to say it, inconvenient. Um, uh, but that, that's, that's how it goes. Uh, again, there are ways in which you can uh, uh, work around that. And there are simulators that are better suited uh, to work uh, that around. Uh, determinism uh, using a gazebo simulator uh, over with a ROS2 stack, it's uh, almost impossible uh, to achieve. Um, with a, a single threaded uh, standalone Drake uh, based simulator, uh, things get much easier. They, they've uh, gone through some uh, lengths uh, to uh, yeah, uh, ensure this is feasible. Um, okay, um, actuator support. Um, this usually amounts to uh, having control over the state of the uh, joint, the joint's degrees of freedom, uh, but some simulators take things a little bit further out. Uh, Mujoko in particular supports other more complex actuation models that you're gonna find elsewhere. Uh, addition addition uh, actuation models from Viking Reapers uh, or uh, uh, muscle actuation models for tendon actuated links. Uh, and m alongside Mujoko, Drake, Isaac Sim, uh, also include more sophisticated controller, more sophisticated controllers uh, that the ones you will find in Gazebo, uh, Bullet, WebOut, Soul 3D, which usually stop short at uh, BIDs, uh, which are also useful. And this does not mean that you cannot uh, you, you cannot try and, and replicate some of the functionality that it's on these other simulators, on the ones that don't have it, but at least you won't find it out of the box. Uh, which, uh, which is why I say below that uh, Mujoko and Drake are the most comprehensive for actuation. Uh, and in particular, Drake, uh, that the way you are allowed, that the, the way it's architecture and the way you're allowed to uh, model controllers using an API that's very much inspired in Simulink, if you've ever, if you've ever used it, makes it, uh, uh, let's say, a shorter gap to reach for someone that's coming from a control background. Uh, uh, it's on sensor support that things reverse and Gazebo and WeBots uh, uh, shine a little bit. 
uh, all simulators support some degree of uh, sensing. Uh, RGB cameras are pretty much a given because you you, you have to do scene rendering. Uh, uh, but Gazebo and WebOS in particular uh, have built all over time, a broad collection of sensors uh, ranging from RGBD cameras, IMUs, sliders, radars, sonars, uh, four stock sensors, uh, GNSS, uh, beacons, uh, and more. Uh, actually, for the AUV project, we ended up streaming a, uh, a, a support for acoustic beacons and a Doppler velocity logger. Uh, so uh, that, 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 uh, that list keeps on growing. Some sensors, you could argue, are simple, some bordering uh, being almost simplistic, but they are often good enough to get started. Uh, and you can always iterate and build uh, on top. So let's uh, say that we've already chosen a simulator. Uh, what kind of hardware do we need to use that simulator? Uh, Unfortunately, specs will depend a lot on what you're trying to do, uh, but there are a few rules of thumb that apply, that do apply nonetheless. Most physics engines uh, rely on single thread CPU algorithms, uh, so faster CPUs will usually perform better than many, uh, or slower CPUs, unless, of course, you're uh, running multiple instances of your simulations, I don't know, for gathering data. Uh, PyBullet and physics, uh, which is the backbone for, uh, uh, well, one of the backbones for Unity, the backbone for i 6 and uh, and also for O3D are the exception here because they also have GPU uh, equivalents of, this, uh, of the same algorithms. Um, for rendering, uh, NVIDIA dominates the GPU market completely. Uh, many simulators will work best, if at all, on NVIDIA chipsets. All the uh, engineers at Ecumen that work uh, on simulations daily have, uh, we, we make sure they have uh, recent, if not latest, uh, NVIDIA uh, discrete graphics cards uh, to not be constrained in their work. Um, uh, and one word, uh, and perhaps to put this in context, uh, I was saying before that not every uh, simulator, not every simulation needs to be photorealistic. Uh, sometimes you do need photorealism, uh, but do know that it's quite demanding, uh, so to speak. Uh, as a reference, uh, Isaac Sim may not even run on a computer that has less than 16 gigabytes of RAM, 12 gigabytes of video RAM, and less than an RTX 3080. Uh, the, that the, that uh, workstation that you see in, on the image is one that we have uh, uh, at HQ. Uh, I, I think it features an RTX 3090, uh, which amounts to 24 gigabytes of video RAM. I think it has about 32 or 64 uh, gigabytes of RAM. and some of the for some of the most complex demos, it still struggles sometimes a bit. So you need a beefy machine uh, to get the the fancy graphics. So let's say we have the hardware, we have the simulator, and we need to run my, the, that simulation thousands of thousands of times. Uh, we're generating data. We want to prove that our system is uh, robust in the face of uh, uh, different uh, conditions. How fast can we run that? Uh, I mentioned when I was talking uh, about the research AUV uh, that uh, uh, one of the reasons to have that digital twin was to be able to uh, test the missions much, much faster than real time. The AUV would be uh, out in the ocean for weeks at a time and you kind of really wait weeks uh, to test your new control. You want to do it in minutes. Uh, well, as it was the case for hardware, again, this will depend a lot on what you do with it, how complex your simulation is, uh, the size of your simulation, what accuracy you need out of it. But we do know, obviously, that the speed is inversely proportional to the scale and the complexity of the simulation and, uh, and also to the expected accuracy. You are forced to take uh, larger uh, steps with your physics engine, and that degrades accuracy. Uh, but knowing that, well, the simpler and, and the simpler and coarser you, you make your simulation, the faster you can expect it uh, to run. Uh, if you don't need to use complex meshes for collision geometries, don't. 
if you um, don't need uh, great graphics, don't. So let's say we are past that. We have already chosen our simulator. We can run at the desired speed. We have the necessary hardware. How do we program it? How do we work with it? Uh, most uh, uh, most of the uh, simulators uh, we've discussed uh, have been written in C, some in some, some C, some in C++ for performance. But fortunately, nowadays, uh, Python bindings are more common, and they are getting more common. We've got Mujoko Bible it, obviously, uh, Drake. Uh, offer uh, these bindings, which streams line, stream, streamlines prototyping quite a bit. Uh, Unity is the odd one. Uh, it, it offers a C-sharp based uh, uh, scripting interface. For the rest, you are back to, well, for the rest and for, for, for whenever you need uh, performance, you are back to C++. Uh, it is on the workflows that you use to program the simulator that uh, you find greater variation. Uh, some require you to write, um, uh, there we go, uh, uh, fully standalone programs. Some have uh, plugin uh, interfaces like a Zeebo. Um, some support like in application scripting. Uh, I think O3D supports, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Lua scripting. Uh, in general, the father, away you go from robotics specific tools the better the uh, programming well no better is not the right wording uh, the simpler uh, the programming uh, experience gets um, and because uh, working on this kind of uh, technology without visual aids is near uh, well it's not impossible but it gets really really hard uh, all simulators offer some form of uh, GUI. Um, plain 3D perspectives you'll find across the board. Um, but visual cues for troubleshooting, think contact visualization, think uh, um, inertia tensor, well, uh, geometries that approximate the inertia that you've assigned to your body, those are not that that common. You will find them in uh, uh, Gazebo, uh, WebOts, if, my, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But then you go to O3D, you go to ISXIM, and you will need to code uh, to get that out, to get that information out. Um, note that uh, camera sensors uh, and other sensors uh, sometimes uh, LiDAR, radar uh, sensors are, ba are also based uh, uh, on rendering pipelines, uh, require 3D rendering. So 3D rendering will always be on and running. Even when you are running headless, for instance, in the cloud uh, or, or on-prem, if you are uh, uh, running some CI, some continuous integration workflow. Uh, and this, that there's a little gotcha here that we've learned over, uh, along the road, uh, can have dis undesirable effects uh, because of how uh, window managers deal with uh, these applications. Uh, they usually instantiate uh, a thing that's called virtual frame buffer. Uh, so the application still believes that it's rendered into a display, but that, uh, at least for X and Wayland, uh, which are the window managers you're going to find on Linux distributions, uh, don't uh, have hardware acceleration. They don't use the GPU. So you've turned off the, uh, the visualization the, the, the window where you see, and suddenly your uh, camera got much, much slower than it used to be. Uh, so careful about that. Um, so scene descriptions. Uh, we have the uh, programming interface. We have the graphical interface. Uh, either way, uh, there might be some of, uh, well, you, you'll find them in both. Uh, um, there usually is a file-based. Uh, scene description. Well, most simulators uh, define one. Uh, a description that you can interact with uh, from the graphical interface or from programming APIs. Uh, formats are uh, plenty, uh, but fortunately uh, there is, or at least over the years, uh, the community has uh, reached some consensus around URDFs, uh, Universal Role Description uh, Files, and SDFs, Simulation Description Files. Uh, to the extent that you will uh, find that most uh, simulators, 
and I believe it, that's the case for all the simulators that, that we're discussing, um, have the means to make use of this these descriptions. Uh, so you're not you're, you're not forced. Uh, well, although you still can uh, use some of the least uh, least um, popular uh, uh, descriptions, which make it uh, harder to. Uh, for instance, change to later further down the road, or uh, or add to the overhead of uh, making that transition or picking up a new tool. Um, the documentation is something that uh, one usually, at least not that the start thinks uh, uh, a lot about, uh, but it can dramatically change uh, the over the user experience. You, you can, if you get great documentation, your experience will be better. If you have Awful documentation, your your knowledge will vary a lot. Um, um, and on that note, um, examples and tutorials you'll find for all of them, especially for the ones that uh, need uh, to provide or document walkthroughs, uh, because they are very heavy GUI centered, uh, like three D, for instance. Uh, but outside that, uh, API references are common. Uh, you will find that. Maybe not online, but next to code, at least for the open source ones. Uh, but design documentation is not. It, 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 it's really not the case for many simulators that you uh, have to uh, have a, a, an easy way to uh, to know what's going on under the hood, unless you go and look and uh, you look at the code, uh, essentially. Uh, and here, Mujoko and Drake are very clear exceptions. Uh, Drake, in particular, has some of the cleanest code and some of the most comprehensive documentation that I've ever ever seen in open source software. Uh, the learning curve is steep, uh, but you have the resources uh, to to walk that 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 path. Um, and because uh, one usually uh, puts together an entire simulation, because ultimately uh, you you want to uh, test. Uh, well, you might be. You may be interested in trying to complete software stack. You may be interested in just trying a controller or some new agent. Uh, and for that, you'll have to very likely integrate the technology with some other technologies. Uh, and throughput, repeatability, we uh, talked about determinism before. Stability are also very much affected by the software, obviously, that is making use of the simulator and how these, these have been integrated. For instance, when you're integrating simulators with ROS2, some simulators have uh, a native integration in the sense that um, there is uh, no other traffic. Uh, well, really, the definition is, uh, is is based on in opposition to the other one. Uh, there are simulators that uh, have their own middleware going on. I guess he was an example. Uh, Isaac Sim, I believe, is another example. Uh, so integration amounts to having some form of bridging between middlewares. Uh, the ones that don't do that are what we call native. Those bridges come with a performance penalty, uh, a performance penalty that can be substantial. Uh, so uh, bear that in mind, especially if you want to go fast, uh, it, it may not be the simulator itself that it's restricting you. Um, uh, and before I go on to the next one, uh, and related also to integration, um, this again, perhaps may be obvious to anyone that's been working on this for, for a while, but uh, whenever you're integrating other software, uh, watch your clocks, make sure that everything is running on the same timeline. There are uh, There is software that has been um, designed and constructed such that distributing a clock that is not the uh, steady monotonic clock or the system clock uh, uh, is easy. Uh, some other code is not as easy. Uh, and yeah, yeah, you need this for everything, uh, for everything to work. And you also need to consider the um, overhead that that clock distribution has. Uh, again, in ROS2, ROS that happens through uh, uh, through messaging. Uh, so you usually eat up the latency of the middleware when distributing clocks, which will, which would or which can, again, uh, cap uh, the, the speed at which you can, at which you can go. Uh, 
all the simulations, or sorry, all the simulators uh, that we have been discussing so far have a solid community, and that's why design I, we chose them uh, uh, to be. Uh, but not all the simulators have uh, online resources, uh, specifically simulation assets that you can uh, go and grab to uh, bootstrap uh, your simulation. Um, Gazebo and WebOuts have uh, online asset collections that are free. Uh, Isaac Seam um, has comes bundled with one. Um, the rest, for the rest, you're uh, essentially out of luck, and you have to resort to generic 3D assets. Um, and the thing about uh, generic 3D assets, the ones that you may find on the Uni Asset Store or elsewhere, is that they are not, not always simulation material. Um, um, we've had to uh, curate uh, them in the past uh, to actually make them useful. It's not that, that uncommon to find broken meshes uh, out there. Um, and last but not least, uh, availability. Uh, and this is especially important. Long, well, it's important for a number of reasons, all the, besides the ethos of uh, behind open source technology. Um, most of the simulators we discussed are open source and uh, are licensed under commercially friendly. I'm not sure if that's relevant for you. It's, it is relevant to us. Uh, some are, are not. They are proprietary, uh, which means that uh, well, what what it means for every <laughs> for for every piece of software in this in the same uh, situation. Uh, if you go with proprietary uh, proprietary code base. Uh, you will be probably locked. Well, probably not. You, you will be locked. Uh, you, you will be subject to vendor locking. And you will not be able to take a look uh, under the hood when things go wrong. Uh, and that usually makes for a much tougher ride. Uh, um, OK, uh, so to summarize, a few rules of thumb uh, that were the style over time. Um, Gazebo and Webots are great when you want to do fast prototyping of mobile robotics, uh, and they can be used for functional testing on a wider range, uh, for, for a wider range of applications, uh, the AUV being one case. Uh, Unity, Isaac Seam, O3D are great or are worth uh, the expense uh, when you have uh, perception systems that you want to uh, train or test, uh, and you can equally uh, uh, um, simulate, uh, have full simulation for, for mobile robotics, uh, like it was the case uh, for Gazebo and Wibots. Drake and Mujoko, as I said, have a steeper uh, learning curve, uh, but they shine in the more complex uh, applications, especially for manipulation and grasping. Uh, and they can also be used, I mean, once, once you've uh, uh, done your due diligence, uh, they, they can be perfectly used uh, for uh, a wider range of, uh, of application. And PyBullet, uh, Bullet was originally, well, at the very beginning, it, was, uh, it had a wider use base in the gaming and film industries. Uh, it, nowadays, it has found its place in the reinforcement learning uh, community. Uh, the way they have integrated with uh, an open AI gym-like API makes it very easy uh, to integrate and to test uh, uh, RL-based uh, controllers and ideas. Um, so if you are interested in more, uh, I uh, here, well, well, uh, here I've curated a list of uh, relevant uh, publications uh, that compare different simulators on different uh, different aspects of different subsets of simulators. Uh, they are all fairly recent, I believe, so they, they, they that should still be uh, still be valid. Um, um, uh, I will later make sure that uh, this uh, uh, presentation is uh, distributed so that if you want to look, you can. Uh, and uh, running out of time, uh, to wrap it up, um, or to summarize, uh, state-of-the-art multi-body simulation, dynamic simulation is widely accessible. 
uh, and that's an asset. It's not. Uh, it's that. That's not true for every uh, every, every domain. Um, this accessibility means that uh, robotics researchers and industry practitioners like ourselves alike uh, anywhere can leverage this today. Uh, but the knowledge domain is, is vast. Uh, so it still requires a degree of uh, craftsmanship. Uh, it is key that before you start, you clearly define uh, the scope. Uh, and once you've done that, there is value in knowing what to use and, and when. And for the future, uh, the future looks uh, bright. Uh, in recent years, uh, some uh, approaches have been coming up that could potentially invalidate everything we've been discussing uh, for the past uh, hour uh, in the coming uh, five to 10 years. Uh, from RL approaches for simulation and identification to physics informed neural networks uh, that have been constrained uh, to give physically plausible outputs to using foundation models to generate generate full scenes. Uh, we'll see what the future uh, departs us. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, that was full 50 minutes. Sorry about that. Thank you all. Thank you all for listening. Uh, looking forward uh, to your questions today or tomorrow in the group discussion. Thanks so much, Michelle, for the really interesting talk. Uh, we definitely have some time for questions. We've got uh, folks online, if you want to ask questions, you can feel free to just unmute and ask them, or you can drop them in the chat. Um, people in person have questions. That's great too. Maybe while, while, what was that? I was just going to ask questions. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm okay. Oh, okay. Uh, well, maybe while people formulate their questions online, I can start with a question. So, um, there's lots of discussion around, uh, you know, sim to real gap for, especially for, you know, training data-driven methods. Um, and I feel that uh, maybe your your talk, while not contradicting that, offers another, uh, you know, perspective just on sim to real, you know, veracity or for lack of a better term, you know, just how much you can achieve with simulation. But what do you feel are the the circumstances that are most challenging to develop a you know meaningful simulation pipeline to the in today's you know world. That is a very uh, interesting, very interesting, a very complex question. Um, so, uh, like like I was uh, saying before, uh, and this does not relate to the technology at hand. It relates to uh, the, the, the processes and the expectations around the technology. Uh, much of the um, of the work uh, we do, uh, or have the work we do, has more to do with clearly defining and scoping what you need out of your simulator than actually uh, achieving it. Uh, it is true, however, uh, that uh, the gap remains there and that Still to this day works as a barrier. Uh, there are uh, projects where we will where, where that gap makes for a backstop uh, for us to for us to country. There, there's no way. There, there's really no way to circumvent that. Not because of uh, because the technology is not there, but because. Um, uh, the cost is not worth it for the purposes and expectations around uh, using the simulation for what it is or for what you uh, for what you want it to be used. Uh, um, hmm. So that, that that that's a long long winded uh, way of saying um, the gap is still there. Um, we usually don't hit it. I mean, usually problems arise well, well before you reach the, the well, well before you reach that, that gap. Uh, mm -hmm. um, your, your integration, your software stack might, might be completely unstable, or you may not be able to run at, at the speed that, that you want to be, able, to be able to care about how close your, uh, your, uh, your model uh, reflects uh, reflects reality. Um, I don't know if that answers in full the question. 
certainly add some more color. So thank you. Uh, other questions from folks online? Uh, yeah, Fernando dropped one in the chat, but then he said it was the same as mine. Oh. <laughs> um, maybe I can ask one more then. Um, something I've noticed is you sort of touched on a little bit the, the ease of use aspect and in terms of, you know, what simulators have Python bindings and things of that nature. Um, I've noticed, especially in research where, you know, especially PhD students are not professional software engineers, uh, you know, this can be a major barrier to uh, to use of simulation tools. And on the other hand, uh, really easy to use simulators, even if they're much less full featured, like, for example, simulators that were originally used in courses at Penn have been then adapted to be used in research, for example, uh, people have gotten really far with that. And I'd be curious if you think that, um, you know, that's just a, a sort of, for lack of a better term, a cop out and that we should, figure, you know, we should put the effort into, to, you know, and upfront to use more powerful tools that will serve us, you know, well in the long run. Or if you think that, you know, there's a, a defense to that along the lines of what you said about, you know, use the tool that is actually, you know, don't, don't bring a, you know, huge powerful tool to a simple problem. So that that still very much stands, uh, which is no excuse to not go uh, to, to not raise your head and go look uh, what all the other uh, tools offer. Uh, it is true that the that the learning curve will be steeper, especially if you're not coming from the software background. Uh, it will take much longer. At the end of the day, um, it really depends on what you need to do and what you need to achieve. Um, I mean, some of these tools are great, but if you don't have the time and you have a paper to present in three months, the reality, it, it's reality getting in the way. Fair enough, yeah. Um, I, I can ask a question. So uh, you were mentioning before that that for the symmetrical gap, like you will find uh, uh, issues that are like, a, more important before you hit that gap, but isn't that uh, a survivor bias by any chance in the sense that most of your projects were projects in which the symmetrical gap wasn't a big component? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. It could definitely be. Yeah. The That said, things have improved in the last, I mean, I've, I've been with the company for almost nine years uh, and things have been still improving. Uh, and by improving, I mean the complexity of the simulations we work with have steadily uh, grown uh, in that in that same lapse of time. Uh, so yes, it, it is definitely survivor bias uh, and um, I think that that's about it. <laughs> for for tomorrow, something I'm curious is what um, development tools do you use? Uh, like, if if you could like have a small um, discussion about like how how to uh, because a lot of the simulation pipeline is being sure that that um, you're getting the maximum performance out of your system and that you're not losing cycles in things that are not not useless. So um, I will bring up this question tomorrow. 